Hello, everyone. Welcome back to session three of Enduring and Overcoming. So hopefully by now you're still watching. That's a good thing. Um, but you are taking notes again and going through it and looking at it for yourself. It's vital that you look at it for yourself as well. So we ended in Matthew 10, 22 last week where we said, you'll be hated uh, by all men of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. Again, it's just a reminder that it, it's not just those who chucked up a prayer, okay? Um, now, we're going to look at part, part of enduring and overcoming is keeping God's commandments and also um, doing His will, okay? So this is another, another aspect of it that we're going to look at. So, keeping His commandments. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Do, do, do you see that? So how many people do we have confessing or, or professing that they love Christ, but yet they're not doing his commandments? They're not doing anything to help anybody. They're not loving the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They're not loving their neighbor as, as themselves. They're not, how, how many you know, commandments are they breaking? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's part of enduring and overcoming. John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, remember I said last week, that's 1,522 times the word if happens in the Bible. It says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Do you see that? So there's a possibility of a person not abiding in the love of Christ. It says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15 is full of abiding. I'll bring a teaching out on, on abiding, but that's what it says. If you keep my commandments, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. John 15, 14. You are my friends, period. Does it say that? No. What does it say? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Do you see how clear that is? These are the words of Christ. Not the words of Marty. Not the words of somebody else. These are the words of Christ. If you love me, keep my commands. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. I don't want to feed the hungry. I don't want to lay hands on the sick. I don't want to preach the gospel. I don't want to do these things. It's not up to you. It's up to him. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. That's what it says. If you don't keep his commandments, it is clear you don't love him. It's just as simple as that. 2 John 1, 6. And this is the love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. It's amazing. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. It's amazing. John 13, 17. And you know the, if you know these things, happy you are if you do them. Why? The Bible says in James to be a doer of the word. If you don't a doer of the word, you are deceiving yourself. Are you not happy? Do you have not joy? Then do the things of God and they will bring you joy. Do you need joy? Then get up off your couch and get some things done. Go minister to the, to the sick. Go, go, Bring some food to the to the to the poor or to the homeless or go a minute do something, and it will bring you joy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in you loves to do these things. He loves to reach out. He loves to help. He loves to do these things. He gets excited. So the joy that's in there, he because one of the fruits of the Spirit is what joy. So he will do these things in you, and it will bring you joy. It will joy will manifest in your flesh by you doing the things of God. Hands down, bar none. I mean, we were driving Guadalajara, Mexico one time when we were there. We were just going to this church and we were going to preach. 
and we're, we're driving down the road and the traffic in Mexico, there's nothing really, you know, happy about that, but we're driving down the road and I just felt this overwhelming joy, just this, it, it, this excitement in me. And there was no reason. I mean, I'm driving with, with my wife and we're just driving down the road, heading off to this church. We'd been ministering, you know, a long time and, and we're just, you know, on our way to, to a church to minister. And I just felt this joy. And I was like, what is, why? Like all of a sudden, why am I feeling this joy? You know, just out of the blue, nothing happened, nothing. It was just spontaneous, if you will. And I said to the Lord, I said, why am I feeling it? And he said, because the Holy Spirit gets joy and gets, it gets, it gets happy, if you will, when he's about to do something, when he's about to reach people, when he's about to free people. So the Holy Spirit in me knew what he was going to do at a church we weren't at yet, but he, he knew what was going to happen there. And he got excited in me because he knew what he was going to do. Come on. And that, that joy that he, the Holy Spirit in me, was man, that's experiencing, was having a manifestation, if you will, in my flesh. Yet I hadn't experienced it yet. Do, do you see that? So I was like, I said, I turned to Bridget. I said, I, th I think the Holy Spirit's excited about what, what's going to happen. I was like, the Holy Spirit gets excited? Like, this is an everyday occurrence for him. Why? It never gets old to help somebody. God never gets bored of healing, setting people free, delivering people, seeing people feed the hungry and clothe the naked and, and do all these different things. God never gets bored of it. The Holy Spirit doesn't get bored of it. The Holy Spirit is not going, oh God, I just need a new thing. This, you know, I've been, I've been getting people to, to, to heal and to, and to set free and to feed the hungry. and to, I'm just so bored of it. Can't you give me something new? My heart needs something new. Do we see that? No. Why? Because his commandments aren't grievous. Where do we see that? In worship. There's, I just heard a song. Sometimes I put my phone on if I'm you know, writing or working or walking or doing something. And I turn the phone on and I just put it on Spotify and I just let that go. And so there's songs that come on there. And this, this one song was on there is going, Lord, I need a touch from you or something like that. My heart needs something new. No, it does not. The only reason you think it does is because you're not doing what God told you to do because his ways are not grievous. If you're seeking something new, you're not doing the thing that God told you to do. End of story. So I just want something new. Oh, God, give me something new. The Holy Spirit's not good enough. The Holy Spirit is the one that was healing and setting free and doing the work on the face of the earth for all of eternity. He's not asking for something new. Bored Christians are bored because they're not doing the work of the Lord, because they're not keeping the commandments. Why? Because they don't love him. They don't love him enough to actually go do something. But when you go do something, you feel the joy of that of the Lord in you and it, it manifests in you and you want to go do something. And while you're doing that, you feel that. And that church service in Guadalajara, Mexico, when we went there, God moved mightily in that place. Mightily. Marriages were restored. People were healed. It was, it was an amazing time. Why? Because the Holy Spirit knew what he was going to do. The Holy Spirit has shown me many times where we've gone to preach in different areas and what he shows me the day before, the week before, comes to pass. We were up in, in Tapalpa uh, in Mexico, way up in the mountains. And we were, we were back there and we we're going to preach in a small town a couple hours down the road or an hour down the road, whatever it was. And just before the night fell, I was out in a field by myself. Everybody was enjoying, you know, food and company and fellowship and different things like that. And I'm out standing in a field by myself, bawling my eyes out. You know, why? Well, I'm out standing in my field. Anyway, I'm out there and God is showing me what he wants to do the next day. And I was so overwhelmed by what he wanted to do. It was incredible. And, and so we got back in, we got into this, this vehicle, we we're driving down the road. We actually drove over into the ditch and the truck was actually sitting like this with the wheels up in the air. I wasn't driving. And we had to jump on the back bumper and a couple of us and, and get the truck to go down as we kept backed out of the ditch. And it, it was pretty funny. Anyway, so we got down these long kind of scary Mexican roads and and uh, got down to where we were, where we're back to where we were staying in Tapalpa. 
And then the next day we had to go down to, into this church and we got down there and the pastor looked at me and was like, who is this guy? You know, it's a long story, so I won't tell the whole thing, but he was looking at me like, who is this guy? Like, you're the preacher? Yes, I am. Are you, are you judging the vessel that God's going to use? Because that's on you. So anyway, this big, long thing, you know, and finally he came to a realization that, that we, he'd been told that we were coming and there's nothing really we could, he could do about it. So he got up there and preached, but I knew what God had already shown me that he was going to do. So I got up there and I preached for probably 45 minutes or something like that. And then, you know, we unleashed God sort of thing. And God set people free. There was there was um, such manifestations of the Holy Spirit. There was also manifestations of the demons as well. Um, people were set free. People were were healed, and I mean all the stuff. People laying everywhere. Just pa- the whole place was packed. It was a big church, packed full of people getting healed and set free, and and I mean all the stuff that was going on. And the pastor finally came over to me, and in very broken English, he said to me, "That was crazy." And he said, will you pray for me? And then I realized he had a whole back brace on his back and I prayed for him. He said, you come back anytime. And we did go back, you know? So the, the power of God was present in those meetings and the God, God showed me, the Holy Spirit showed me what he wanted to do in those meetings. Why? Because he gets excited to do things. The Holy Spirit doesn't get excited. I feel the Holy Spirit in me right now so, so strongly. Why? Because I'm preaching words of life. Why? Because I'm preaching the words of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit gets excited and going, yes, that's truth. That's truth. Get it out there. You see? But people who do nothing, the Holy Spirit's bored in them because they're not keeping the commandments. I'm commanded to speak. I know my call. I know I'm fulfilling my ministry. I know this. Bridget and I know this. We, we go around uh, as much as we can nowadays uh, to, to preach the gospel. And, and we know this is what we're supposed to do, but beyond the shadow of a doubt. The question is, what are you supposed to do? See, sometimes people have their eyes upon us and they're like, oh, what are they doing? They're not, they're not doing this or not doing that or whatever. What are you doing? What are you doing? That's the question. Because like I said in the last session, God's not going to say, you know, what, what did you do with this? Well, you know, Brother Marty, I was with Brother Marty. No, no, no. What, what were you doing? Well, I, I, you know, I, 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 I did this with Brother Marty and Sister Bridget. No, what are you doing? What are you doing? So take your focus off other people, put your focus on Christ, and be responsible for what he's called you to do. Anyway, let's move on. 2 John 1, 6. We read that, actually. John 13, 17. I think we read that. Yes, it is. So John 13, 17. And you know these things, and happy if you're doing them. We read that one, too. Um, 1 John 3, 8, and 9. That's where that whole story came of Happy if you do them, because it was just that manifestation of the joy of the Lord. 1 John 3, 8, and 9. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. Do you see that? He that commits sin is of the devil. Now, this doesn't mean if you're a Christian and you go down the road and you blow, you blow a tire, you have a flat tire, you get out, you fix it, that you're of the devil. No, this, this means if you're living in habitual, willful sin, you are of the devil. Do you see that? It's what it says. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he what? Might destroy the works of the devil. So when the Son of God is in you, the Holy Spirit is in you, and he's manifesting, what are you supposed to be doing? Destroying the works of the devil. That's every Christian's calling. Whosoever, so this is talking about you soever, or me soever, is born of God, does not commit sin, does not commit habitual, willful sin. People have taken this and they've twisted this to say, well, I'm in God, so I can't sin anymore. That's what they've taken. Whoever is born of God, born of God does not commit sin. So I can do whatever I want. I can go out and steal and loot and, and, and murder and, and commit adultery and fornication and all these different things. And it doesn't matter because I'm born of God. Liar. The devil is a liar. And people who preach that are liars. 
For his seed remains in him, and he cannot willful, habitually sin because he's born of God. Anybody who's truly born of God, this is why I keep talking about, about uh, fruits of repentance and fruits of salvation. If you are born of God, you will not willfully li live in sin. Now, you may be dealing with a few things on your way through through maturity and you may, you maybe you have a hang, you shouldn't but and, and you can't excuse it but maybe you have a bit of a hang up that you're trying to deal with deal with it and move on and don't go back to it first john 2 3 and 4 and hereby so here do you want a, a measuring stick to see if you're in christ well here's one right here and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments do you see that this says if you don't keep his commandments you don't know him we read in john chapter 14 verse 15 if you don't keep his commandments you don't love him you're not we read also in john that if you don't keep his commandments you're not his friend that's what it says People, again, people take this stuff out of, out of scripture. They take it out of the Bible. They don't preach it. Why? Because it doesn't make them feel good. If I can make you feel good, I can fill the seats. And if I can fill the seats, I can fill my pockets. You see how that works? Verse four. He that saith, I know him and keeps, okay, this is, this, this is the Bible. This is not me. He that saith, the Christian, the person who says, I believe in him, I know the Christ, he's in me and I'm in him. If that person um, says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Do, do, do you see that? Look at it in your Bible. Flip it open right now. If you don't have it ready and open, flip to it, turn to it and see that's exactly what it says. He that saith, I know the Christ, I'm a Christian. I do these things, I love God, I'm in him, I, 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 he's in me, I'm a child of God. And if you say that and don't do his commandments, the Bible says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. It's what it says. Do, do you see this? Do you see why the Bible says to, to, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Because there's a cost to pay. There's a price to pay. Revelations 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints, or the consistency of the faith. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus. Consistency in keeping the commandments. If you keep the commandments, you will have consistency. They go hand in hand. They work together. Now, that was just a little bit on the keeping the commandments. Let's move on to doing God's will, talking about enduring and overcoming still. This is all part of doing it. Why? Because if you are busy doing the commandments, if you're busy doing the things that you need to do, you won't have enough time to do the things that you're not supposed to do. Do you see that? And it's part of enduring. It's part of overcoming. Doing God's will. Matthew, you hear me quote this a lot. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Now, listen. Well, I'll read this first part and we'll back up a bit. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's talking about the world. How can it be? He says, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord. The world doesn't call him Lord. Believers do, or so-called believers. They call him Lord. But you see the words of Jesus. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So there is people right now and passed away and will pass away that, that went through life calling him Lord, but did not know him and they did not enter the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to say, but he that does the will of my father, which is in heaven. So not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that's called him Lord, professes to, me, to be Lord, even have said, I make him Lord of my life. Why? Because there's no fruit in it. There's no fruit of repentance. There's no fruit of salvation. Do you see how I'm, Jesus said, I'm coming back for fruit. He did not say I'm coming back for decision makers. The decision makers are the ones in Matthew 13, 41, that, that Jesus will send his angels and they will pluck out of the kingdom those things that offend. Decision makers are usually those who offend. Those are the ones that are the wheat and the tares. 
There's wheat in the church and there's tares in the church. The spots, spots and blemishes are talking about people within the church. Do you see that? Jesus said in, in Matthew himself, you turn to it, Matthew 13, 41, I will send my angels and they will pluck out or take out out of the kingdom those who offend. Well, again, those who offend are what? Those who are just decision makers that have no fruit. They claim to be Christians. They live the life of, of the devil. They expect a crown of life at the end. And those are the ones that Jesus said, you're going to call me Lord, but you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's go on. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name? In thy works, haven't we cast out devils? Haven't we done these wonderful works? What do we have right now? I'm, I'm afraid for this generation. I've been talking to a few different people about this, and I'm afraid of this next generation. Am I, am I not afraid of them, but I'm afraid for them. This next generation that, that, that's coming up right behind us, the, the, the 20, 30-year-olds in that, in that range somewhere, there's a lot of them going to church. There's a lot of them going to, you know, schools of ministry. They're doing the, and I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not saying that, but there is some that aren't good. They're going to these things in droves. And what we're seeing a lot of is an influx of youth getting involved with churches and ministries and things, which people would look at it and go, that is awesome. And there's an aspect to it that is awesome. But where my heart is afraid and what I've talked about to, to trusted brothers in Christ is this. We have a generation that's focused on power now. Because, like I talked about in session two, the, the identity has been perverted, so now it's just relegated to just power, but that power must come out of holiness. That power must come out of knowing Christ. And I'm afraid that there's no depth beyond power to these people, and they think the gospel is about power, and it's not. It's about holiness. It's about right standing with God. It's about righteousness, not self-righteousness, His righteousness. Do you, do you see that? And I'm afraid for these people that they're coming up and they're, they're trying to walk in the power of God. They're trying to do these things. They're going to these schools and, and, and it's so much hype that there's no depth to it. There's no depth to that. There's no depth to just, you know, going around and, and laying hands on the sick and, 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 and uh, you know, evangelizing to as, as many people as you can see if there's no system in place to bring them into where you can get discipleship. Jesus did not say, go out there and make decision makers. He said, go make disciples. You can't disciple unless you have relationship. You can't do it. And I'm, I'm concerned that we have people walking around, um, you know, doing these things that we're reading right here, casting out devils, prophesying, you know, going on treasure hunts, as they call them, and doing many wonderful works in his name. Why? Because that's the depth that they have. I have another teaching on here called How Deep Is Your Root System? You need a root system. You don't need a root system that's a mile wide and an inch deep. You need one that's a foot wide and 400 feet deep. Why? Because those are the trees that aren't coming down, the ones with the deep root system. I helped somebody the other day use a big backhoe, uh, and they had to dig down probably at least 10 feet or more to dig out this, this tree, and the root system was massive. And it was ripping the backhoe right up, literally right up off the ground. That tree would have never come down. Why? Because it had a root system that was round and deep. And I'm concerned now, very concerned, that we have this next generation that are just sold on hype of identity. Yes, there's a thing called identity. The Bible doesn't really use it, but we call it identity. And there is a thing of knowing who you are in Christ. What, what, what is that? The new man. That's what the Bible calls it. The new man. Okay? Now, we, we can identify with Christ. I get that. And there's aspects to it. But they're only identifying in something that has no root in it. You need to identify as the righteousness of God uh, in Christ Jesus. You need to identify uh, as his child in holiness and sanctification and consecration. And out, outside of that, or in that, comes the power. I'm warning people. I'm warning the young people. Please, don't get caught up in the, in the, in the, in the hype of, of, of what's happening. Don't do that. Please. Get around some strong-minded people. Take a break from the hype for a second and go talk to some rooted and grounded people in Christ. Because I'm afraid we're, we're creating this generation. Verse 23. 
So these people said, look at all these things we've done. Verse 23, and Jesus said, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from you, you, work, you that work iniquity. So there's people that will be doing these things, but yet they're going to be working iniquity. Notice it wasn't the works that got them there. It was the iniquity that kept them from going there. I'm warning people. This next generation of people going to church, that's awesome. That, that are wanting to preach the gospel and do these things, that's awesome. But do it with a right relationship with the Father. Have fellowship with the Father. Please. Let's move on. Matthew 12, 50. For whosoever shall say to do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother. Oh, sorry. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, is, this, is the, same, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Do, do you see that? Because they came to him and they said, hey, listen, Jesus, your family's here to see you. Your mothers, your brothers, all these, these people are to see you. He's like, who's my mother and my brothers and my sisters? But those who do the will of my father. It's amazing. James 1.22. James 1.22. Just trying to see if we're going to finish this. Yeah, we'll, we'll finish it. We'll make this a three-part series. We might go a little longer today, this week. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. How many deceived people are we seeing sit in church right now? I was a deceived person sitting in church for 17 years. Why? Because my, the church never said, go be a doer of the word. Go preach the gospel. Go do this. Go do that. One church we wanted to belong, or that we belong to, just wanted to call the police on every homeless person that walked through the door. That's not being a doer of the word. Hebrews 10, 36. You have need of patience or consistency that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. After you've received, or after you've done the will of God, you'll receive the promise. Remember, we're talking about doing the will of God, which is part of overcoming and enduring. It's not you've done the word of God. You do the word of God, which is part of overcoming, enduring all the way to the end, which is what? Keeping the commandments, doing the word of God, doing the will of God forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor for the Lord can be in vain. Why? Because you're not being steadfast or unmovable. You're not abounding in the work of the Lord. You may be doing some sort of Christian ritual. Revelation 2.26 And he that overcomes and keep my works unto the end, him I will give power to the nations. We, I think we read that in session two, but it's, we got to keep hitting it. The enemy attacks because he's an enemy of God and of men. And we must be wise of his tactics. You can't turn the blind eye to what's going on around you or you're not wise and you will be blindsided. If you just did this all the time, you're not going to see what's coming this way or this way. This is what we can be assured of. John 16, 33. These things that I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And because we're in him, we can overcome the world as well. Do you see that? How do we overcome the world? Not in our own strength, but in him. 1 John 2, 13 and 14. I write to you, fathers, because you have known them that is from the beginning. Or known him that is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. See, it's knowing the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Overcoming the wicked one does not mean just in position and I can live how I want. That means you are still serving the devil. If you serve sin, sin is your master. And who's the father of sin? The devil. 
If you, I'm, I, again, I'm not talking about a trip up here and I'm not talking, if you serve sin, sin is your master. Romans 12, 21. Be not overcome of evil. What are we seeing today? People being overcome of, of evil. But overcome evil with good. Be not overcome by evil. In your emotion, your plans, your desires, your will, don't let them, do not give your will up for anybody except him. That's it. Last two, last three. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory. Victory in Jesus. You know, you can start singing that, but I won't. Victory in Jesus. Victory. What's victory? Overcoming. 1 John 5, 4, and 5. We read this already, but we're going to do it again. For whatsoever, bought, uh, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And that's not just, well, I, yeah, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then I go on to live how I want. Then you don't believe it. You only really believe what you're willing to stand up for. If you're not willing to be vocal for it, you don't really believe it because you're not convicted by it. Last one, 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. We are more than conquerors. We are more than victors. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Revelation says, but we endure and we overcome through the victory of Him who's overcome the world and we do it by faith. What's part of faith? Grit, determination being immovable, never quitting, never surrendering, never giving up, never backing down. That is part of faith. And you overcome the world by faith. So guys, we're going to wrap it up. I hope that you got something out of this three-part series. Um, it's, it's vitally important that you understand this. It's vitally important that you take a stand and say, this is it. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved period. And that comes out of fellowship with the Father. So God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in. We love you guys. Again, drop a comment or subscribe, whatever, and um, just help us get the word out, okay? So God bless you guys. Stand strong, stand firm, stand fast in the faith in Christ Jesus. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye for now.